I requested a, one of the songs this morning, um, but it wasn't the one that took its basis from 2 Corinthians 5. I wanted to sing a child of the king, but um, that's kind of a scary thing when that happens, whenever uh, the song and uh, the message kind of line up like that. <clears throat> um, kind of an exciting thing to think about. But um, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, um, we'll read um, uh, some verses there. <clears throat> For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being that, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that which we be unclothed, but we might be clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. <clears throat> now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. For we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home <clears throat> in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made, made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearances and not in heart. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day that you blessed us with. Thank you for your word and your, your gospel promises. Father, we ask that you would uh, be with us as we worship you now in spirit and in truth. I pray that uh, we can uh, hear the words, that, uh, the message that you have for us. Give us eyes and ears to hear and to, to retain and perceive. Lord, may we be encouraged where we need to be encouraged and, and, and change where we need to be changed. And we trust that your word is powerful to do that. Uh, bless those who cannot be here and desire to be, Lord. We pray that you lift them up and bless them. And bless the preaching, Lord. May Christ be seen. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this morning I want to continue on in our study that we've been having on the future things of the believer. Um, we've looked at death and we've looked at the resurrection. We've looked at the intermediate state between uh, uh, after we leave this body until the, uh, the final uh, the state, the eternal state. We saw an introduction to premillennialism, and we took a couple weeks to look at the outline of things to come in the 70 weeks of Daniel. Well, um, you know, I know I promised back in February that we were going to do the, the millennial reign, and this might be the, the longest introduction to a message uh, that, that I've ever preached, but I want to look at two more things that will happen before we get to that millennial kingdom. Um, there's a lot of other things that we can talk about. I'm, I'm not going to focus on the tribulation period because we're looking at the life of the believer. And I don't believe we'll enter in that tribulation period. But I want to look at what happens to the believer, what we have in store. So the next two studies I want to look at is two events that will happen after the rapture. After Christ comes and, and calls his people up to be with him in, in the clouds and before his second coming to earth that we read of in Revelation 20, there's a couple things that the Bible details very specifically that will happen in the life of the believer before the millennial reign. So, to this morning, I want to preach to you on the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Um, this is what Paul was speaking of here in, in 2 Corinthians. That's what he was appointing them to. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Um, our life, it counts for things. This is not a, a wasted time. We don't waste our time in, in the things of God. 
because we all have in a summons that we're going to have to keep in the judgment seat. One of these days, we're all going to have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And this judgment seat is different from the other judgments that you read of in, in the Bible. There's several future judgments that are going to come. Uh, Matthew 25 speaks of a judgment of the nations, where he, he separates his sheep from the goats. We read a judgment on earth of Babylon, that God is going to judge Babylon on earth. You read that in the book of Revelation. Um, you read of the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. This is where God is going to call all men who do not have faith in Jesus Christ, all who do not have union with Christ, will be called to this great white throne judgment. And the books of their life will be opened up. And God will judge every man according to his works. And if you're outside of Christ, there's no works that are pleasing in his sight. That is the judgment where the, the, the guilty uh, will be eternally damned. That we will be cast, or those who are outside of Christ, will be cast eternally into the lake of fire and brimstone. And there spend eternity in the judgment of God. That is the great white throne judgment that you read of. But this is not the judgment that Paul is speaking of. I don't believe in a general judgment where there's just going to be one judgment and that God is going to judge everybody and then you either make it to heaven or hell. I believe that there's, there's several judgments there. Um, in fact, um, if you want to turn there, you can. But in 1 John chapter number 4, um, there's a reason why I don't believe that we're going to have that uh, general judgment where we're, where we're staying before God. or several reasons, but this one in particular. In 1 John 4, 17 and 18, it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. We have not to fear that great day of judgment, because we have union with Christ. We are not condemned. We are not, uh, we have, there is no condemnation for those who have union with Christ. So we will not stand before that great white throne judgment. We will be there. We will be present. And we will shout hallelujah as God uh, offers judgment unto the reprobate. But we will not stand there at that judgment because our sin has been judged in Christ. But there is another judgment. And this judgment occurs during the tribulation period. So while the seven years of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble is on the earth, this judgment will happen um, up in heaven with God during that time period. I believe that the, the millennial or the tribulation saints will have a similar in nature to this judgment, but this is for the, the judgment seat of Christ will be where God's people will stand before the famous seat of Christ. And will give an account for their life that they've lived as a child of God. We must all stand before this judgment seat. So uh, the first thought is, it's a summons that we must keep. Notice, if you see there in our text, the we, who it's talking about. You say, well, this is probably talking about the unbelievers. And I, I read some commentaries where they said this is referring to the unbelievers who had, who had uh, been members of, at Corinth but weren't truly saved. But if you start at chapter 5, verse number 1, just look at the we, uh, the, the pronoun we there. For we know that if our earthly tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building not made with hands. And if you go on, and I think every verse of, uh, in that, maybe except for one or two, have that we is talking about. We walk by faith, not by sight. The same pronoun we is referring to the Christian there. We groan to be with the Lord. We shall be clothed. We are always confident, knowing that while we're in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident and willing to be with the Lord. We labor that we might be accepted of Him. And then it gets to the text, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So this is, you know, there's no question that the previous verses are talking to the church in Corinth. And then verse number 11 stresses that for we, the same ones who groan to be with the Lord, and the same ones who are confident, knowing that when we die, we'll be with the Lord and walk by faith and not by sight. But the same group of people 
We know we must, we must all appear before Christ. And that word appear um, is an interesting word. It's really not strong enough in our English uh, language. It, it isn't that we must appear and be present. It's more than that. It does mean that, but it means more than that. It, it's not simply that we all have to show up. We're all going to be brought before. And it's not just that we're going to show up and stand before a Christ. But it's almost every other time it's translated, it's translated manifest or, or manifesting. For we are going to be made manifest um, before the judgment seat of Christ. We are going to be opened up. We are going to be examined. And in fact, the same word that's used in verse number 11 um, for manifest, um, it, or verse number 10 for appear is used for the word manifest in verse number 11. So this, for we must all appear or be made manifest is the same word that's used in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also we are made manifest in your consciences. So it, it's, we will be made apparent unto God. And just as God knew, or Paul knew that God knew his motives, and Paul's motives were apparent unto God in preaching, he prayed that his motives would likewise be as clear unto the Corinthians, that they would be opened up and explored and, and made manifest. So we are going to be, uh, we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But we will stand before Christ, opened up and examined as for our true motives. That's what Paul was talking about. He persuaded men, but we are made manifest unto God. We are opened up before God. God knows why we do this and what our true motives are. And we pray that you will know that as well. And when we stand before Christ, we will appear exposed before him. And all of our works and our true motives will be examined before the Lord Jesus Christ. We must appear and we must stand as individuals. We must stand as a church. We will stand as a church and, and stand before Christ as what we have done for the Lord as a church. That we will be examined upon that day. What did we do with our time as a church? And what did we do in our worship? And what did we do um, with our, with our uh, service to Him? We will stand as individuals. We will each stand before Christ and give an account for the life that we've lived here in the body. So this is a summons that you must keep. This is not a judgment for heaven and hell. Um, the, the believers will not stand before Christ and Christ say, well, you know what? You lived a miserable life and now you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. This is not what this judgment is about. This judgment is how we live, how we serve our, our king. This is a summons that we have to keep. There's coming a day when you will stand before the king who saved you. You will stand before the Christ who died for you. The, the Lord who called you. And one day in the future, you actually will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. As he sits on that banner seat, a, it's a platform that's lifted up. As you, as you look up to him, you will look up to him there and he, you are service to him will be opened and made manifest. Secondly, we'll, it's a judge we must stand before. It's a summons we must keep and it's a judge we must stand before. This Christ you will stand before. Um, and this is a sobering thought to me really, to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 10, We know that, that it's the Apostle John that penned the book of Revelation, the same uh, apostle that you read through the book of John, where it, it refers to the apostle whom Jesus loved, and it, and it talked about how he would lay his head upon the, the breast of the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep in mind, this is the same John that, that we're hearing about here. In John chapter 1, verse number 10, And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's a good place to be on the Lord's day in the spirit and um, I heard a, behind me a great voice as a, of a trumpet saying I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last what thou seest write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia unto Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea 
And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and behold, he turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a white, with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, says John, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and death. So the same John that <clears throat> for three years was ever present with the Lord upon this earth in his earthly ministry and laid his head upon his breast and loved him and followed him and served him. The same John when he saw the, the revelation of Christ there uh, in the glories of heaven fell as, as he were dead. When the manifestation of his glory is made uh, in effect, John fell down and was undone. When he saw the holiness of Christ, much like um, Isaiah in, in uh, Isaiah 6, when he saw him, he was undone. And this is the Christ that we will stand before. This is the Christ that you will look up and, and give an account for. And that should be a sobering thought for us here this morning. It should wake us up out of our sleep. It should put things in, into perspective. That the Lord is coming again. That the, the master of the, the house is coming again. That he's coming back. And... and you, will he find us faithful? Will he find us serving? Will he find us living as we are? It should motivate us. That's what Paul says there in verses 8 and 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is why we work, Paul says. This is why we labor in our labor of love. We labor because of what we were given. We, were, we labor because of the mission we've been assigned. Labor for Christ is not a suggestion or an option. But our love for Christ should motivate us. And the knowledge that He is coming again should motivate us. The knowledge that He just doesn't leave us out here to, just to, to do whatever we, we, we well please. But He has left us here to serve Him. He has placed us in His church to glorify Him. And we are going to give an account for what we uh, have done for him. And that should motivate us. It motivated Paul. It pushed Paul as he faced perils of, of robbers and perils of waters and, and as he was beaten and as he was stoned and as he was persecuted from place to place. That pushed Paul. That drove Paul to the glory of Christ. But to also know that he had been given a mission and a responsibility and that Christ was coming again and he was going to have to stand before his master and his king. Our Lord has gone to a faraway country, but he's coming back. And he's going to come back, and he's going to come back and, and examine what we have done. What we have done with the talents that he gave us, and what we have done with the uh, abilities that he gave us, and the mission that he gave us. It should motivate us. It should haunt us in a sense that it should ever be in a part of our minds. It should melt the fear of man and push us to obedience. It should shame us when we fall, but motivate us to continue on, knowing that so there is no condemnation in Christ, but uh, he will, uh, we will um, have just this one life to live for his glory. It should humble us that we are servants of Christ. It should humble us that, that we are at best unprofitable servants. It should humble us when we think, you know, we, we've been given this life, we've been given these blessings, we've been given uh, this opportunity to serve Christ. And we so often fail, but Christ will never fail us. But Christ will never uh, let us uh, go or let us fall away. But still, he, he is with us ever and always. That should humble us when we consider that we're going to stand before him and thank him and, and offer our sacrifice, uh, um, our, our life, up to him. Our body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. So these thoughts should humble us, but it also should embolden us when we think about the judgment seat of Christ. It should embolden us to do the right thing, 
To know that doing the right thing will cost you now. To suffer for doing the right. To lose now. To do what is right. And sometimes the right thing hurts. Sometimes the right thing causes pain. Oftentimes, doing what God has called us will not result in the pat on the backs from the world, but the condemnation of the world. Amen. Oftentimes, we are faced with the, the choice or the decision whether we will be bold in the declaration of God's truth or we'll just shrug our shoulders and, and, and leave it lie. The fact that we're going to have to stand before Christ should embolden us to say, you know what, my Lord is with me. And I'm going to do the right thing, no matter the cost. And God will make it right in the, in the age to come. And, and that should be our perspective. Because God is going to make it right. Um, John Knox uh, said, a man with God is always in the majority. And John Knox um, fought against the Catholicism uh, that, that was pervasive in Scotland. And the, the queen was against him, and the, the Catholic Church was against him, and that's what he said. He you know, said, so you're outnumbered, John Knox, you shouldn't stand for the truth. He said, a man with God is always in the majority. So it could, be just, it could just be you against everybody else in your family or at work, but the man, the person with God is always in the majority because who's bigger than God? So it should embolden us to stand for the right thing as we envision Christ. As we read there in, in uh, Revelation 1, his voice is the trumpet. When we imagine that voice that shook the, 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 the temple, that shook uh, the heavens and the earth, we hear that voice saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That should embolden us to not care what uh, the, the chuckles and the laughs and the sneers will be against us. So as we meditate on the age to come, that is something that what should embolden us. You know, the, the old Baptists, the old men and women uh, of God through ages to come used to meditate often on eternity. Um, I was reading some things about uh, if you took the collection of the writings of the Puritans and you took the collections of the writings of the old Baptists and, and you read what they urge and stress people to meditate on. The one was the, the gospel, the, the, our union with Christ, but another thing right up there after that was eternity. To focus upon eternity and, and the eternal uh, life that we have, and, and not to focus upon so much things of now, but to focus on the things of now in light of eternity. And we do this, and we think about that we'll stand before Christ. Uh, all these things that should should motivate us, and haunt us, and humble us, and, and embolden us, and cause us to stand for the truth and earnestly contend for the faith. Thirdly. We have a life that we have to give an account for. We must give an account. In uh, Romans 14, in verse number 10. <clears throat> but why dost thou judge thy brother? But why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So this is pretty clear. He's talking about Christians. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now this does not refer to sinfulness. It does not refer to, to judging whether a thing is right or wrong. This is referring to um, the what we can might term gray area matters, where the Bible doesn't explicitly um, forbid or command one thing or the other. Things where the Bible doesn't specifically command whether you should have um, a smartphone or a, a regular cell phone, or it doesn't command whether or not you should have the internet in your house. Because obviously there were no such things as those in, in Paul's day. So these are areas where we must search the scriptures and, and, and look to see whether or not we should do those things. And, and if the Bible doesn't explicitly command or forbid something, then that's between that person and the Lord. Well, he's saying that we're all going to have to stand before Christ. Now, you, people say, well, you have liberty, so you, know, you don't tell me what to do. Well, we have liberty, in the, but that overarching thing is we're going to have to give an account. We're going to have to give an account how we use our liberty. 
We'll have to give an account what we did with the word and how we lived our lives and what we did with the things that God gave us. We must give an account for that. Now, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we, I stress that and underlined it two or three times. But, but at the same time, we must give an account. So that was what Paul was saying. He said, we have liberty in Christ. And let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But just remember this. You're going to stand before the Lord. Uh, you don't be your brother's judge. And you don't judge your brother in these, these gray area matters. But you're going to stand before God. And God's not a gray matter gray area type of God. You're going to stand before him and you're going to give an account for him. God promised that he would remember our sins and iniquities no more. That, that we are not going to stand and God is not going to condemn us at this seat for our, for our sinfulness after because our sin has been dealt with on the cross. So we're, we're not going to be dealt with for our sins here. Um, but this is a different kind of of judgment. Because without faith it is impossible to please him. So without faith you can't please him with good works or bad works or works in between because there's no distinction there. Without faith you have no good works. But we will judge, be judged from the time that we have been born again to the time that we live this earth for the things that we have done in the body according to we have done either good or bad. The distinction here uh, that we read in our text is what kind of works that we did. What kind of works that we did. So your life will be brought back before you and, and it will be recalled in this judgment. So from the time that the Lord has saved you to the time that you leave this earth, your works will be judged on what sort they are. What kind of works that you did. And, and it will be judged on that basis. So God is not going to condemn you for your sins at the judgment seat of Christ because he's already condemned Christ for them. Christ has already been judged for our sins. But our works will be judged. What manner of works that we did, whether um, or in this body, whether they be good or bad. In 1 Corinthians, um, if you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians, um, <clears throat> Chapter number three, <coughs> me, verse number nine. It says, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For, uh, for other foundation, can no man lay, then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. So there's our word again. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall abide, he hath a builder upon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but, um, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. So on this judgment, we are not judged and condemned for our sins, but our, judge, our works will be brought to light. So from the time that we're saved and to the time we leave this earth, God is going to bring before our works here at this day of, uh, this, uh, this day of judgment. The works will be manifest, will be brought to light. The good or bad works will be made manifest. The secret works to this world will be revealed and rewarded. You know, the works that you do for the Lord that nobody else knows about, on this day they'll be revealed. They'll be opened up. The hours or the wee hours of the morning where you're praying for your brothers and sisters, the times that you wake up with, before the sun comes up and you just pray for your brothers and sisters, those works will be revealed on this day. The days that, that you go and you just kind of weep over your sins and, and ask the Lord to forgive you of your, your sins, and the, those works will be rewarded. The days in which you give alms to the poor, those, those works will be revealed. All those secret things, all those hours of prayer and, and Bible study and, and uh 
meditation upon gospel truths and, and helping and giving to the poor and serving the Lord, all those things in that day will be made, brought to the light. And we don't have to have people pat us on the back now because God is going to bring those manifest and reward in that day. But lots of people have their, their rewards here in this life. Boy, you're such a, a good fellow. You, you do such great things and on and on and on and on. Jesus said they have their reward. But it's those who enter into the prayer closet and pray and nobody knows it but the Father. It's those that seek Him and fast Him. And it's those who, who give and help in secret where the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And it's those that are going to be brought to the light in this day. And God will be, Christ will be glorified and we will be rewarded. <clears throat> Persevering in the hardships will be rewarded. When we persevere in the hardships um, that, uh, that we go through in this day, this day is when it's going to be rewarded. The false accusations will be set right. <clears throat> All those evil workers of iniquity that lie about the, the saints of God and, and spread false rumors and, and all kinds of, of different things such as that, uh, these, this is the day where Christ will reward and set things right. This is the day that you'd be blessed of all people to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. This will be the day where those who were persecuted for Christ will be rewarded for their labor. Those who have been long forgotten by this world and, and are not even a footnote in the pages of history, it will be this day where they'll hear the well done now, good and faithful servant. Those who persevered in the service of the Lord while others were against them, it will be this day where they will be uh, rewarded for their, their reward. Those who were hated by this world and despised, but were faithful to what God had told them to do, it will be this day where their works will be brought to life. And if you keep on reading in chapter number 4 there, um, Paul says in verse 3, But it is with me a very small thing that I should be judged of you, were of man's judgment, yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing about myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the hearts. And then shall every man have the praise of God. Paul would stand before the Corinthians and point out their sins and say, you know what, it doesn't really matter a lot to me how you judge me. You can say that I'm not a true apostle, and you can despise the way I speak to you, and you can despise the way I preach to you, and you can, you can believe these false accusations if you choose to believe them, but it's a very little thing for me to be judged of you, because I don't even judge myself, because I don't even trust my own judgment, but I'm going to be judged by Christ. And see, if you're a faithful child of God, the judgment seat will not be a, a day of dread, but it'll be a day of joy. It'll be a, a day when the things will be set right. It'll be the day where the people who laughed at you and said, you're wasting your life, you're wasting your time, you need to be focusing on money and focusing on retirement and focusing on all these other things. It'll be this day where you'll be vindicated and shown that your faith in Christ was worth it all. So the works will be brought to life. We also find the works will be put to the test. We read there that the works will be passed through the fire. And he said, if you build upon, he, he says, imagine this foundation. So Paul and the apostles and Christ, they laid a foundation. And then everybody builds upon that foundation. So what are you building? He said, some people will be building up structures made of wood. And some will be building walls made of hay. And some people will take, uh, uh, make walls of, 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 of uh, sawdust and hay and stubble, and just uh, flammable nothing. But some people will be building structures of, of gold and of silver, and, and it's going to pass through the fire. Now what do you think is going to happen whenever you have a house built of wood and hay and stubble, and the fire, the refining fire of the judgment comes? Well, there's not going to be anything left. And that is what the, the idea is here. It's in your life, it's like you're building, and you're working days and hours and years of your life, 
and it's going to be burnt up at the judgment in the sense that, that it won't be worth anything in the eternal scheme of things. The sinfulness, the idleness, the wasted time and effort will just pass through the fire and be burnt up as if, as if it was nothing. The works for God, though, the faithfulness, the service, that will be only refined and rewarded. The time that you spend in faithful service to God will pass through the flame of that the judging fire refined and you will glorify Christ um, as, uh, as he rewards you there. <clears throat> God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, as it says in Hebrews 6.10. He is not unrighteous to forget that, which you have showed towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know, we just had our Bible conference and you may have... Uh, you know, went and got somebody something to drink. Or you may have picked up a piece of trash that was laying there. You may have done some small thing, or you may have done some great thing that nobody else in this church really knows about. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. That's something an unrighteous person would do, is to, to overlook someone's work for them, or not even see it. But God sees all things, and God's not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. You know, you may have done something 20 years ago in the name of Christ that you forgot about. But Christ is not going to forget about that. Amen. Sometimes uh, I'll write down stuff, like if I go preach somewhere, I'll write down things that, that happen and are kind of funny or just um, strike me, upset me, all kinds of different things. And I'll go back to go and look, and look, just 10 or 15 years ago, I'll read them. So I forgot all about that. I forgot that that happened. You know, I forgot... I can, we forget things. God's not going to forget. God's not going to forget your faithful service. And before you go and say, well, you know what, I'm not a missionary and I'm not a, a, a preacher, so, so this sermon is just for, for people who, who preach or go to foreign countries. That's not what this is talking about. And I'm not saying you even have to do those things. I'm talking about what God has, has commanded us to do. Are you faithful in Bible reading? Are you faithful in prayer? If you go through the book of 1 Peter, chapters 2 and 3, there's a whole list of things that God commands us to. And I'll just summarize them. Are you faithful in warring against the flesh? Well, you'll be rewarded for that. Those hours, maybe you're at work, and there is a temptation there, and it is burning at your heart, and you're warring against your flesh. No, I cannot do that. I will not do that. I cannot succumb to this sinfulness. You'll be rewarded for that warring against the flesh and mortification of the flesh. Are you living in a good, honest conduct among the world? Are you living in a, in a way that brings glory into the Father just by being living in good, honest conduct? Or do you, you know, if you leave the house of God and people who know you best, would they say, well, there's a godly person, there's a God-fearing woman, there's a God-fearing man. Well, you'll be rewarded for that life of good, honest conduct, just living, uh, just, you know, if you go to the ball game and, and you're kind to the people there and you help the people there for the glory of Christ, not for the glory of yourself, but for the glory of Christ, he will reward you. Are you faithful in being a good citizen for the glory of, of God? 1 Peter 2, 13 and 17, that is something we're commanded to do, to be good citizens for the glory of Christ, that no... Um, this, uh, no um, ill reproof would become on the name of Christ as we live in this country. In 2 Peter uh, 2, 18 through 21, are you faithful in your job to the glory of God? Do, do, does your employer say, you know what, I'd like to have 20 more of this person because uh, they, they're honest, they're reliable. And why do they do that? Because well, that's a good Christian person there and, and I'd like to have those people, more people like that. Well, that's a good testimony upon your Savior. I worked at the, when, when we lived in North Carolina, there was a seminary there. And um, you know, thousands of people go to that seminary. And I had one guy tell me that he won't hire preachers anymore. Yeah, I think it was at Home Depot. He said, I won't hire preachers anymore. He said, they come in, said they're lazy. He said, they won't work because they, they just say, think of this as a temporary job and that they act like they don't have to do anything. He said, you might be a good worker. He said, but I'm not going to hire you because you're a preacher. What a terrible thing. What a terrible testimony. What this guy should have, if, if 
these men were living like they should have been. He should have went, been going to the seminary and said, you know what, I need to find some more of these people because they're the best workers I've ever had. You'll be rewarded for that, just being a good worker for the glory of God. Wives being in faithful subjection to their husband, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. You'll be rewarded for that. Husbands, loving your wives and giving honor unto your wives for the glory of God as unto the weaker vessel. You'll be rewarded for that. Women in subjection at church. Women uh, covering your head in the services. You'll be rewarded for that. You know, that's a sermon in and of itself. That when people come in and they don't understand the things of the church, and they see women in, in subjection, they see women with their heads covered, that preaches a sermon, that preaches a message, that, that, that tells people things. You'll be rewarded for that. You know, things that, that men leading in prayer, fulfilling their role in headship, you'll be rewarded for that. These are things that God deems important, and you'll be rewarded for your faithfulness. You'll be rewarded if you eat supper right. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. If we eat for the glory of God, He will reward us for that. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Um, uh, tells us that, that God has given us all things to eat. And that, that if all things are good, if they're sanctified by prayer. Um, that, that if we do these things, if we sit down and thank God for the food and not grumble and complain about what God has provided and let nothing be refused but eat to the glory of God, we'll be rewarded for that. You know, the people say, well, you can't eat this and you can't eat that. You can't. Well, I'll eat gluten to the glory of God. If you want to be gluten free, that's fine, but I'll eat it to the glory of God because it is for, uh, He has given it to us, and nothing is to be refused if we do it that way. And, and what I'm trying to draw out here is that your faithfulness is more than simply coming to church, and that there's not two separate lives, the sec secular life and the sacred life. Your sec secret, uh, sacred labor and secular labor. I certainly would like to do more in the service of the church if I could devote my time to the word and prayer. But in God's providence, um, I can't do that. So I, I must be faithful in all my labors. And I don't separate the two. I don't say, well, I have a job. I'm a pastor, but I have a secular job. I, have, I, I work for the glory of God. I do all things for the glory of God. And whether it's rest for the glory of God, work to provide for my family for the glory of God, Stand behind this pulpit and preach for the glory of God. Whatever I do, in every walk of life I, I, I live, I try to do it all for the glory of God. And you will be rewarded for that. If you live your life that way, do all things for God's glory and the honor of Christ, it won't be wasted. And finally, there will be works that are wasted. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. 2 John 8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have brought, but that we have received the full reward. <clears throat> Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your one and only life that God has given you. Let me qu close here with uh, some, a story that John Piper wrote in his book, Don't Waste Your Life. He said, A couple took early retirement from their job in New England five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. So now they live in Florida where they cruise on their 30 foot trawler, they play softball and collect shells. He said, are you going to come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God given life, and let the last great work of your life be this, playing softball and collecting shells. He said, picture these two people standing before Christ at the judgment seat and say, Lord, look at my shells. Don't stand back and wish that you'd serve Christ. My boss used to have a sign in his office that said, uh, you're never going to get to the end of your life wishing you'd spent more time at the office. Well, you're not going to stand before Jesus Christ and say, I wish I'd, I regret serving you, Lord. I regret mortifying my flesh. I regret putting off sin. I regret waking up and going to church. I regret waking up and reading my Bible. I, I wish I had spent more time watching TV or, or, or doing nothing. I wish that... I wish that I had not searched. No one's going to say that. 
There will be no regret for serving Jesus on the day of judgment. May God give us grace and desire to serve Him. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.